This is an educational series by the Ukrainian Fire Chaplain Show. Slavi Susu Christ to glory to Jesus Christ. This is your host, Christopher, and welcome to our study series on the Church Fathers. If you've not already, go ahead and check out our website, www.theufcshow.com. Also, if you head to that website, you can get some information on an awesome new series that hopefully will be airing starting in May on the Ukrainian Catholic Catechism called the Catechism in a Year. So for more, take a look, take a look at that. But let's go ahead and get into today. Who are we going to be looking at today? I think we're going to be focusing on Polycarp of Smyrna, and we're going to try to ask the question, who was he? Why should we study him? We're also going to kind of take a look at some of the literature and some of the things that we know about him. So let's go ahead and dig into it. Who was Polycarp of Smyrna? Well, as best as we understand from the documents that survive us, uh, Polycarp of Smyrna was one of the first Christian martyrs, and he was also a bishop and successor to the apostles in Smyrna. Now, some of you are going to be asking the question, Smyrna as in northwest Georgia, Smyrna as in... So if you go ahead and take a look here at this picture that I want to put up on the map, uh, we'll get a picture of exactly what we're kind of talking about with the geographic region. As best as the information that we have, he lived around 70 or so AD, was born then, and was ultimately martyred around 155 or 156 AD. Some of the dates are a little bit speculative. Uh, we can't exactly resolve that due to some of the historical dating, but as best we can tell, it's either 155 or 156 AD. Who was he? What is his relationship to the Christian community and the early Jesus followers? Well, from some of the other early Christian writers whose documents survive us, we know that Polycarp of Smyrna was a friend of Ignatius of Antioch, who we just spent uh, the past two months or so studying with uh, multiple parts on his various letters to the churches. Polycarp was also a friend of Irenaeus of Leon, who we will be studying later this year. Uh, Irenaeus of Leon, uh, Leon obviously giving an indication of uh, what we would call modern day France was uh, another prominent church writer whose works give us tremendous insight into some of the heresies and some of the disputes, a um, number of which are not relevant to us today. They've died off. Uh, but Irenaeus of Leon was another great early Christian writer who bears witness to the authority and uh, the role that Polycarp played. The most important figure or most important relationship that Polycarp had was that he was a uh, pupil or a, a student of St. John the Theologian. It's what we call him in the East. In uh, Western circles, he's also uh, very commonly known as St. John the Evangelist or the author of uh, John's Gospel and also the author of uh, Revelation and the Catholic Epistles. So here you have this first, um, this the second century, literally first generation of disciples of the apostles. Uh, we've also talked about Ignatius being that. We've talked about Clement, but here we have in Polycarp another first generation of disciples of the apostles. What is what do we know about his personality? Well, from what we can tell, Polycarp uh, was definitely uh, a man of uh, of good humor. Uh, there's reports in some of the other early Christian writing that survive us that uh, describe one of his encounters with uh, Bishop Marcion, who was uh, one of the early dissenters from uh, the, the Jesus followers in the Christian community, where Bishop Marcion ran into John the Evangelist, it said, and, oh, do you know who I am? And, you know, Polycarp's response was, yes, you're the firstborn of Satan. You're a child of the devil. Um, he, you know, he, he definitely had some salt and pepper in his language and didn't spare that humor. Now you'd say, obviously that wasn't how he talked to everybody off the street. And we as Christians in charity should not necessarily going around calling everybody that, you know, is not, you know, a, a full member of the church of Christ, you know, Oh, you're, you're, you're must be a reprobate of the devil of Satan. No. However, he, he used that rhetoric towards, you know, a Bishop who had been like Judas in the communion of, of the church, uh, and then had knowingly left it and denied it. Um, so he had a particular reserve for clergy that would ultimately abandon the tradition and the practice of the faith of the early church. 
Some of the other things that we know is, uh, and then we'll get into with his account of the martyrdom, are some of his humorous statements during his, uh, his subsequent trial and execution that we'll look at in one of our next episodes. Some of the other factors that were going on around the time of Polycarp's life were, again, uh, two prominent heresies or two prominent uh, dissenting communities uh, or dissenting factions within the Christian community. One was the Docetist heresy. The other was the Gnostic heresy. And again, the Docetist just comes from the, the word meaning to seem. They basically said Jesus was kind of like a ghost. He only really seemed to appear, didn't, didn't actually suffer, only seemed to suffer. And then you have the Gnostic group or the Gnostic heretics, which basically taught that salvation was through this secret knowledge that Jesus gave to the community and was not for everybody. Um, and, and we can get into those in specialized episodes later, but I really want to focus on the life of Polycarp and not necessarily uh, do our entire focus on these very important heresies that do need to be studied by us as we look at the early church. Some of the other prominent events during Polycarp's life would have been obviously uh, some of the violent persecutions of Christians. Uh, as I had mentioned, he was born after a number of the big martyrdoms with uh, Peter and Paul in the mid-late 60s. Um, however, towards that, that end of the first century, we, we do have a number of uh, persecutions and martyrdoms of Christians that Polycarp survived and lived through. And that's important to have in the back of our mind when we look at how he understands you know, the essence of being a Christian in, uh, in the one letter of his that survives to us. One of the other things that was obviously going around, uh, which I believe I'd mentioned in previous episodes, if not, I'll dig into more, is that he is living during the first real steps of documents beginning to arise, indicating which letters and, and accounts, memoirs of the apostles that were circulating around were actually uh, legitimate uh, representations of the Christian community and legitimate representations of the life of Jesus Christ. Said simply, he was around uh, and, and oversaw a church when the New Testament canon was beginning to take on uh, its first shape and the first uh, categorization of what we would believe to be legitimate, divinely inspired uh, works of the New Testament and those that we would later exclude. One of the other uh, aspects that he was living on, and his, his letter indicates a little bit of this, was the development of accounts of church structure and also the organization of the Christian community. Ignatius of Antioch, uh, again, who we, we spent uh, eight episodes on uh, looking at his letters and his life, uh, gives us a real good hierarchical understanding. And there are many others, Polycarp being one, who will give us some further insight and some further light on this subject. Uh, according to St. Irenaeus, who we'll look at again later, uh, Polycarp was appointed by the apostles themselves. Uh, as I had mentioned, a student of John the Theologian, John the Evangelist, uh, Polycarp, uh, tradition holds, was instituted as an authority and a bishop uh, by the apostles. That's one reason we give him a, a you know, next to sacred scripture, we would definitely give his surviving uh, writing uh, a, a preeminent authority or, you know, a, a weight that we may not give to somebody, you know, writing in the 8th century or in the 12th century or in the... 21st century. You know, he lived and had that first generation touch. And so we want to try to weight his words with that proximity to, to the apostles themselves. Uh, we also know that uh, Polycarp had a couple of interactions shortly before his death with Pope Anicetus. And in particular, uh, the one of the issues that this was over was the Quarto Deciman controversy. Uh, what is that? For those of you that aren't familiar, the short end of it is that this was one of the early church's uh, disputes over um, basically what day the Christian community should be celebrating Easter on. Uh, for instance, we find uh, to our day right now in 2023, the Christian community still does not celebrate Easter uniformly on the same date. Uh, you will find many Eastern Catholic churches and many Eastern Orthodox churches either um, celebrated uh, according to a different dating um, or they will um, celebrate it on both days, depending upon, like, for instance, the Ukrainian uh, Greek Catholic Church, our church in the diaspora, particularly in North America, will traditionally, uh, especially in the vernacular services, will typically observe Easter um, on the days that the, the Western churches, the Latin churches observe um, in some of the Ukrainian communities and some of the Eastern communities in the West. That's not 
always the case. They typically observe uh, what is more commonly known as the Orthodox calendar. And a lot of that goes in our own day to um, issues between reforms of the, the original Julian calendar versus the Gregorian calendar. And some churches follow uh, a revised Julian calendar. Julian uh, calendar. And what, what's interesting is even to this day, you know, the Christian community still doesn't observe everything uniformly. Uh, and I'm of the personal opinion. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, you'll find that, uh, yes, I, I do have this desire that uh, we would all live this, this one life in common with some sort of basic semblance, uh, especially around the date of Easter. I have a great aspiration of that, but I'm not the type of person that thinks that uh, therefore, if I go around saying you need to do this or if bishops or, you know, the Pope were to go around saying you need to all do this on the same day or we're going to cut you off from Christ. To me, that seems a bit excessive, um, especially when, you know, the, the date of the celebration of something is not, you know, it doesn't affect one's uh, bearing on salvation. And so uh, back in this second century, uh, Polycarp was dealing with this. For instance, uh, Polycarp uh, in his uh, defense uh, and, and debate with Pope Anicetus um, would appeal to St. John and the apostles for their tradition saying, no, you know, we need to follow the inheritance and the tradition from the apostles. Uh, whereas Pope Anicetus would typically want to follow uh, and very much appeal to the Sunday usage, which was, you know, later, uh, later widely adopted, uh, which is not directly related to today in the issue of Easter today. But short end of it is that you know, there is this tremendous compassion and in a certain point, this, this recognition that Polycarp and some of the early Christians had and try to trying to temper this, this obsessive need for uniformity as being, you know, ultimately it's not something that bears on our salvation in the way that believing that Jesus Christ was the incarnate God, um, or that there's a Trinity of persons, um, or that he's present in the sacraments, uh, under various different ways. And for more, we can look at, uh, look at the catechism later for those various different types of, uh, real presences. Uh, the most real present being obviously, um, his presence in, uh, in substance. Um, but you know, there's this, this appreciation that Polycarp bears witness for, you know, the fact that you can have great saints taking different sides, you know, on a very controversial issue, um, of prudence. One of the other interesting things about Polycarp, um, his uh, account of martyrdom uh, was obviously not written by him. It survives in a church letter that was circulated, which is the, the second document we're going to be looking at in this series on Polycarp. Also, we know that um, the account of his martyrdom, this document circulated by the churches, is the oldest genuinely historical account of a Christian martyr that we have outside of the New Testament obviously referencing there the martyrdom of St. Stephen, uh, recorded in the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, Polycarp is the, the oldest surviving account that we have. There's many other contemporaries from that, that time period, uh, especially in the second century, later second century, with some of the other saints. But this is definitely one of the most fulfilled, um, very clear cases that we have. The other interesting thing about Polycarp's life is that he points to uh, a couple of interesting Christian practices that were later rejected um, in Protestant communities uh, and Protestant observances. Uh, one of those is the uh, the veneration of relics. Uh, the other is the Christian practice of um, commemorating saints uh, every year, often on the date of their martyrdom, uh, or as we would call their date of birth into eternity. Now, there are biblical foundations for um implicitly for uh, venerating the, the relics of saints. One of those is obviously found in the Acts of the Apostles, where we talk about the, the miraculous power of the shadow of St. Peter uh, and of Paul's handkerchief. Uh, we find other indications of relics, um, though not relics of saints, relics of Christ, where you, you know, have the, the gospel account of the woman uh, hemorrhaging who touched the garment of Christ's cloth and was healed. And so we kind of get that connection. And, and I'm going to argue that in that sense, uh, we find with, say, the shadow of Peter or Paul's handkerchief, where you have that connection where you have Christ's holiness being passed on to his church and radiating throughout his church decades later. And in many Orthodox Catholic traditions, you would say that that didn't die at that point. That continued through on throughout the church uh, up into our present day. One of the other things that we're going to observe in, uh, in studying Polycarp is that his portrayal of Christian martyrdom 
is very unique. Uh, it is not like most Jewish, Muslim, pagan, uh, or even some form of later Christian martyrdoms. Uh, his particular emphasis uh, or the particular emphasis in describing his martyrdom is not so much about him having this personal uh, faith. It's not about the doctrines uh, so much. It's not about him having a personal God and he's bearing witness to, but it is very much a mystical communion with the suffering God that is with the God incarnate who suffered uh, for us that Polycarp had this, this, um, this invisible, this um, mysterious communion with the God of suffering, Jesus Christ, uh, who endured the same fate. And he views that, um, that similarity with, uh, with Jesus Christ. It's a very interesting take on his uh, martyrdom. And it's one that I think that's bypassed in a lot of, you know, contemporary understandings of, well, you know, these, you know, this cult were all martyred by the federal government or, you know, some people would say, or, you know, you have all of these people blowing themselves up, you know, for this or that or the other religion, um, or killing other people for this or that and the other religion. But his, his view is really this, this embracement of suffering, um, because his God was uh, a suffering God. And there's this, this personal identity and the sharing, uh, between the two over that couple of other interesting things. Some will question the role. Um, some later scholars and, and authors would later question the role of uh, Jews, um, Christian dissenters, we'd call them heretics, but other Christian factions uh, in stirring up the Romans to martyr um, Polycarp and others because uh, religious laws were very lax at the time period. We have this conception that you know, everything that happened, every Roman, every Roman you know, soldier and governor, they were just all out there to slaughter Christians. That's not historically accurate. Um, we get a great example from Pontius Pilate, who was pretty much indifferent to those Jewish sects and really only ultimately martyred Christ because of this incessant persistence of, um, of the Jewish hierarchy and community at the time. Uh, but for the most part, um, except for a couple of you know crazy Roman uh, emperors, uh, most of the people were pretty laid back um, by far and large. Uh, typically, uh, Christian martyrdoms were, were over the centuries in that time period, uh, often a response to a complaint or an informer, much like in any organization today, you know, a squeaky wheel gets the grease, you have an agitator, you have somebody that gets t ticked off or something, whether that's personal, reasonable, or whether they're just completely lost in their mind and have a vendetta against you, you know, once they're driving that train, um, then, then the consequences come. Some of the other occasions for you know serious early Christian martyrdoms around Polycarp's time would have been to the Zealots, uh, especially one of the very rigorous Christian communities who are called the Montanists. Some of the other interesting things, uh, just going over here in this prep of who is Polycarp, why should we study him, are that um, you know it's there's there's no surprise the Roman government officials knew who the bishops were, they knew who the priests were, they knew who the deacons were, they really knew who the Christians were. Uh, there was no huge surprise about any of this. Um, and, and you'll kind of see this a little bit, uh, much like, you know, the communist officials um, that persecuted and attacked um, the Ukrainian church and the Ukrainian underground church in the 20th century. They really know who all the main actors are. The, the real issue is they're trying to get, you know, the Christians to tell on themselves and betray themselves and hand over the scriptures and the rest of that. Um, Interestingly enough, most of the you know, even contemporary scholarship that we have, there's very little reason to doubt the credibility of the account of his martyrdom. It's a bit uh, out there in certain aspects. The sentiment, it's very striking. Um, but I think if you try to look at it with a spiritual eye, uh, you could really see this divine love that moves him. Uh, besides this uh, account of his martyrdom, uh, and the letter, the one letter that we have that survives him, we have uh, knowledge that there were numerous letters written by Polycarp. They just have been lost to history um, for various reasons that, that we'll never know of. Um, the only one that survives, which will be the first work that we look at, is Polycarp's letter to the Philippians. Uh, and then we will look at the church letter circulated um, that included the description of his martyrdom. Uh, what is the sense of this letter that Polycarp had on the Philippians? Um, the big sense that we should take is that it really is a moral exhortation to other Christians. Uh, it talks about Christian teaching. It talks about the organization of the church and the Christian community. And it talks about and describes uh, the nature of Christian charity. 
uh, Polycarp's letter uh, that we're going to read in our next episode, it, it wasn't a theological treatise. It wasn't this great debate over you better believe this and not believe this, and this is why you should believe this, and here's the philosophy, here's the scripture, all this. It, it is really a, a exhortation. It's an encouragement. It has a very different tone from some of the works, such as uh, you know Irenaeus' great treaties, uh, Justin Martyr, who's another church father we'll be looking at in the series, uh, or Tertullian. Um, those had uh, a, a variety of works, uh, very different from, from Polycarp. What are four things we should keep in the back of our mind as we finish up this episode? Uh, one, uh, we'll look and see in chapter seven that... Uh, Polycarp does include um, some understanding and teaching on the incarnation and the, the nature of Jesus Christ or the natures of Jesus Christ, God and man. Uh, and part of that is because he's uh, writing against some of the teachings of this Bishop Marcion that he had an, an encounter with. Uh, the second thing is that uh, he talks about church organization. While there is uh, no mention of a bishop explicitly, uh, he uses uh, the other word presbyter, presbyteros, uh, and, and talks about the importance of the Christian's obedience to priests and deacons. The third thing is the understanding and role of almsgiving in manifesting one's Christian charity. And the last fourth thing that we're going to see in this theme in his work is going to be what a healthy attitude is that a Christian should have towards the state, towards the government. Um, and it's going to surprise a lot of modern uh, American political activists that want to burn everything down. And I, I think that really is a great thing that we need to renew our image, our, our understanding and our, our image that is the role of we're really to be like Christ, uh, co-suffering with him, uh, praying, yes, uh, but also giving that example of, of not going out there and trying to enact this, this violent institution of the government. Um, to enact, you know, our Christian theocracy or something like that and to just overthrow it and, you know, get rid of everybody in our way. Um, he gives much more of like, you could call it sort of an early civil rights mindset, a, 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 not quite a pacifist mindset, but definitely this notion of, um, of obedient suffering uh, in all things that don't lead to sin when it comes to dealing with uh, wicked, corrupt governments. So that's kind of what I have for you today. I uh, appreciate you joining me on this episode. Stick with me next week because we are going to go through and go through the letter of Polycarp to the Philippians. Uh, and then uh, the following episode after that, we are going to be looking at the letter of the Church of Smyrna, where he was bishop, to the Church of Philomelium, uh, which uh, wrote the, the surviving account of Polycarp's martyrdom. So, like I said, if you've not, check out our website, www.theufcshow.com. We have this on multiple YouTube and podcast platforms, and we've got some other awesome series and stuff that you guys could check out there, too. Uh, until further time, we will see you next week. This is your host, Christopher. If you liked today's episode, give us a thumbs up and subscribe. Also, click the bell for notifications on future content. If you haven't already check out our website the ufcshow.com ways that you can support us and find us on other platforms until next time 